Endless Ocean was a scuba diving simulator released for the Nintendo Wii in 2007. It was developed by Japanese developer Erika and published by Nintendo. Erika had at the time worked on a number of games from the Street Fighter EX series to another diving simulator series called Ever Blue for the PlayStation 2. Endless Ocean promised an experience unlike anything else that was available on the Wii at the time. The Wii itself was starting to be flooded with shovelware at this time, so fans were looking forward to any sort of quality game experience they could get their hands on. And while the game didn't exactly fly off store shelves, it did manage to earn itself a cult following. But is this cult following really warranted? I remember buying Endless Ocean the day it came out. I had bought a Wii at launch, and aside from playing through Twilight Princess, I had little to no interest in playing it due to the lack of games. When I saw Endless Ocean's original trailer, I got a little bit excited. I grew up around the ocean and always enjoyed snorkeling, and here was a game that would allow me to explore areas and, and sea creatures I knew I would most likely never see in real life. Of course, it's been over seven years since then. I recently picked it up to play through it again because I'd recently moved from Australia to Canada, which as you can imagine was quite stressful. I felt the need to relax a little bit and I thought seeing as how I remembered playing the game after a work to relax a bit back when it was released, it might have the same effect on me now. And it did to a degree. But of course, in those seven years I've become much more critical of game design choices and I noticed a lot of issues that I never really picked up the first time around. Being a diving simulator, there isn't really a whole lot to the story of Endless Ocean. But that said, what little story there is does at least supply you with some sort of context for all your diving expeditions. You simply play as a nameless diver in the fictional Menorai Sea, a mystical place that seems to lure all sorts of sea life from across the globe, regardless of whether or not they belong there. You are given tasks to complete and eventually handed out story missions from a woman on your boat named Catherine Sunday. She is about as bland as bland can get, but since all she really does is give you tasks, I guess that doesn't really matter all that much. Eventually she starts having an existential crisis about her role in the universe and this is exactly what triggers the real story which is essentially her quest to find the White Mother, a species of whale identified by her father but never proven to actually exist. It could be argued that the actual story is perhaps a little short but in the end of the game it's more about exploration. So whether or not it's long enough or even needed at all is going to depend on the player. The actual gameplay of Endless Ocean also differs in complexity depending on what the player wants to get out of the game. If you just want to swim around and explore, you can do that. If you want to look for lost treasure and lure about Manorai's past, you can do that too. Want to just do side quests and take clients out on dives or take photos for a nature magazine? Go on ahead. Feel like meeting all the local fauna and making friends with them? That sounds like a great idea. Or you could always do all these things at the same time. There's nothing to stop you, and that's really one of the wonderful things about Endless Ocean. The game control is simple enough, and it's actually one of the few games that I feel makes good use of the Wiimote. You don't even need to use the nunchuck, you simply point where you want to swim, and that's it. This applies to both being beneath the waves and on your boat. While it does feel rather clunky above the waves, you never really spend enough time there for it to really be an issue. All in the name of streamlining. Another really nice touch in that regard is the fact that when you want to return to the boat, you simply select it from the menu. The game has a number of these nice little touches to help keep the flow of the game smooth. As I mentioned, there are any number of different tasks you can undertake while you're diving, so I'll try to give you a quick rundown of each element. The first, and the most obvious, is exploration. The Manorai Sea is a large open expanse with plenty to see. The game map is spread into quadrants just like a real map and essentially move your boat from one location to another location. There is no limit to where you can go or move your boat to, as even unexplored areas can be fast travel to. But rather, exploring each area unlocks more side and story quests. The game doesn't so much take into account the areas you have explored, so much as a percentage of the total map discovered. It's an odd system, and the main story won't really kick off until you've uncovered at least 65% of the map, for example, but it does work for the most part. Unfortunately, what this also means is that there's no real incentive for exploration other than your own curiosity, and it sort of messes with the flow of the game's story for the first few hours. Once you clear the hump, however, things improve drastically. While you're exploring, you will come across countless forms of sea life, as well as the occasional piece of treasure. You can interact with each creature once a day. Each time you do, you learn a new fact about them, with three facts in total to learn. You can interact with them by petting them, feeding them, or in the case of dolphins and porpoises, you can even blow a whistle. That's a cute little detail. If you have fully friended some fish, they'll actually follow you around on your dive, which is a nice little touch. There are tons of fish and other animals to find, with some only coming out in certain places during either the day or the night, and discovering them all will certainly take some time. Likewise, finding all the treasures is a time-consuming process. Although, unlike the fish that move around depending on what time of day it is, treasures will always be in the same place. Everything you discover and collect goes into a handy little notebook which you can look at on your ship, and you also gain access to an aquarium early in the game, and any animals you discover can also be put into the aquarium for display, which is a really nifty feature. Lastly, 
There are the side quests. These are dished out via your email back on the ship. Generally, you'll receive an email from someone either wanting to be guided to see a certain fish or buy a magazine wanting to have photos of a specific animal taken. None of the side quests are particularly taxing, although sometimes finding a certain fish can be a real bitch if you haven't completely memorized the area. The photography mechanics in particular are a real joy and anybody who ever played Pokemon Snap growing up will feel right at home. When you're done, you just head back to your ship and you get graded, and sometimes rewarded with upgrades. Although, these upgrades are essentially just cosmetic, it's still a nice little thing to have. All in all, I think the post-game is actually the best part of the game. While you can truly relax the whole way through if you please, I found it easier to really take things at my own pace once the credits had rolled and I'd locked all the equipment. Even now, I still have plenty of fish to find and even a shipwreck and a ghost ship waiting to be found. There's always something more to do in the Mana Rise Sea. Graphically, Endless Ocean is one of the best looking games on the Wii most of the time. When you're underwater, the game can look truly beautiful with some wonderful lighting and some really well-realized environments. While most of the environments are made up of coral reefs, you get to explore some other more interesting and atmospheric locations as well. One of the early locations you can visit is a cave system, which is incredibly well-realized and is one of the most convincing environments I've had the pleasure of exploring on the Wii console. There's also some ruins you get to explore, and while on the surface they can be a little bit bland, they have their own set of visually interesting nooks and crannies. My own personal favourite environment is the Deep Sea Trench. This environment is pitch black and requires a shoulder mounted light in order to be explored. It's foreboding, it's claustrophobic, and it's intense despite the fact that nothing in the game can actually hurt you. Seeing a giant sperm whale come up out of the darkness is honestly one of my favourite pieces of imagery to come out of the last generation of games. No joke. Unfortunately, above the waves the game looks jaggy, awkward, and really and to be completely honest, just plain bad. I don't know what more really to say about it other than that the water segments were obviously where all the time and effort went, and if it was due to time and budget, then I think they made the right decision. I wish that they had just made a nice clean menu system similar to what is found inside the cabin for all the above surface interactivities. And I guess the decision to make a full 3D boat was reached so they could also have the surface animals for you to interact with, but personally, I don't think that the trade-off was worth it, and I think the sacrifices of animals above the surface would have been worth it to avoid the awkwardness of the boat system. All the animals in the game are rendered with an incredible amount of detail. The way they move is fantastically convincing, and while they all operate on rather obvious set paths, it doesn't particularly break the immersion. I do wish there was a little more interactivity between the animal species, it would be nice to see the sharks occasionally pick off a fish for example, but I guess they thought this sort of thing might break the relaxation of it all. There are a number of areas that lead me to think this might have actually originally been part of the game, such as this spot with penguins swimming as though they're hunting, but as you can see there are no fish to be hunted. It's a small thing, but it did occasionally break my immersion. Lastly, there is the audio. This is something that I think divided a lot of people. The things I think everyone loved were the quiet moments. Swimming down into the abyss with nothing but the sound of your rebreather and the dull droning of the water pressure feels fantastic. Likewise, when you find a new area, often a minute's worth of peaceful music will play. This music composed by Ayako Sasso always feels appropriate and never outstays its welcome. However, when you discover some other areas, you will instead hear some more vocal-based music. These tracks coming from uh, New Zealand singer Hayley Westenra. Did I, did I pronounce that right? Well, fantastic in their own right, they tend to loop, which can make them very grating. I love Amazing Grace as much as the next person, but hearing it play over and over for 15 minutes is a bit much. I'm guessing the developers wanted to get their money's worth out of these tracks since they're obviously licensed, but I found myself leaving the area and coming back just so the music wouldn't play, and I could instead dive to the lovely sounds of pure ambience. They really should have just played it once and then faded out like the other musical interludes. The other complaints I have with Endless Ocean are few, but rather significant. The game has some light puzzle solving in it, which at times can feel a little vague, to the point where you're not really solving a puzzle because you don't know you're supposed to be. I think the biggest example of this is the ruins. There are a number of steps you have to take when you arrive here in order to progress. First of all, you need to find a way into the ruins. This is done by doing what the game does best, forcing you to explore. Great, cool, I love it. Where it all comes apart is when you have to make your way into the ruins. There are some stone tablets to interact with, but the problem is the ruins all look very much the same inside, so it's hard to know where you have been and where you haven't. Likewise, it's hard to know which tablets you have interacted with and which ones you haven't without swimming up to them and interacting with them again. To compound this, there is one room which sucks you out and spits you back outside due to the current of the water forcing you up, and that means you have to start over. Now in order to change the currents, you need to change the flow of said water. So you need to find a part of the ruins from the exterior that looks like you can interact with it, but the mapping is a little unspecific so you can't really work out where that interactive area is from the outside in relation to where it was on the inside which you've already rememorized. When you do find it, you think you need to find something specific and touch it, but it rather turns out you just have to swim up to it and here you are and you find the last tablet. Hooray! It's all just a bit confusing and really there's nothing like this puzzle before or after this in the game, so it really just comes out of nowhere and it can be really confusing. 
I believe a little more guidance could have been given without sacrificing that feeling of exploration, as the last thing you want to be feeling when you're playing a game based around, you know, feeling relaxed, is to be frustrated. Another small issue is the fact that it's impossible to tell if you have interacted with an animal or not without going up to it and interacting with it again. This can lead to a lot of repetition, as while most animals look very different from each other, some look incredibly similar. This would have been a really easy fix as well, as already when you hover your pointer over a creature it glows green, and using the same principle, it would have been easy to implement a function where if you have interacted with an animal once, twice or three times to get its information, it could have lit up a different colour. It's a small thing, but it would have alleviated a lot of the repetition found in the game. There is a ton to do and to see in Endless Ocean. It's not a game that would appeal to everyone, as it's obviously incredibly niche, but I don't think it's an essential game for any Wii owner that does enjoy playing games on the system. There's really nothing else quite like Endless Ocean, uh, except maybe the sequel I guess, but if you do pick it up, I recommend that you do, by the way, just make sure you play it at your own pace, as playing is it as you would most other games, as like a race to the finish, will do more harm to your experience than good. Thank <laughs> you.